Suddenly, he began to cry repeatedly. What protesilus is this who has come back to life to plague me? What god of hell have I offended that I should find a rival in a dead man, dead and buried on my land? Aphrodite, you have trapped me, me who built you a temple on my estate, who sacrificed to you so often. Why did you show me Callerho when you did not intend to let me keep her? Why did you make me a father when I am not even a husband? Amid these lamentations, he took his son in his arms. Poor child, he sobbed. Until now, I thought myself blessed by your birth. Now it seems untimely. You are your mother's heritage to me, a memorial of my ill-fated love. Little child as you are, you are not wholly unaware of what your father is suffering. It was a disastrous journey. We should never have left Miletus. Babylon has been our ruin. I have lost the first case. Mithridates turned the accusation against me, but I am more afraid of the second. The risk is greater, and the way the case has begun has left me pessimistic. I have had my wife taken away from me without a trial. I am having to fight for my own wife with another man. And what is worse, I do not know whom Calerho prefers. But you can find out, my child, she is your mother. Go now and intercede for your father. Cry and kiss her and say, Mother, my father loves you, but do not reproach her. What is that you are saying, pedagogue? We are not allowed to enter the palace? What cruel tyranny preventing a son from going to his mother to set out his father's claims. So Dionysus' time, right up to the trial, was spent trying to arbitrate the struggle between passion and reason. Meanwhile, Charius was in the grip of inconsolable grief. So he pretended to be ill and asked Polycharmus to accompany Mithridates, the benefactor of both of them. When he was alone, he tied a noose, and as he was on the point of stepping up and putting his neck in it, he said, I should be dying a happier death if I were ascending the cross set up for me by false accusations when I was a prisoner in Caria, for I should be leaving this life under the delusion that Calerho loved me. As things are, I have lost not only life, but that which would have consoled me for my death. Calerho saw me and did not come to me, did not embrace me. I was there, and she wanted to spare another man's feelings. She did not, she needed, need not feel embarrassed. I will forestall the decision. I am not going to wait for an inglorious end. I know I am a negligible rival for Dionysius, foreigner that I am, poor, already estranged from you. Good fortune go with you, my wife. I call you wife, though you love another. I am leaving you. I will not disturb your marriage. Enjoy your wealth and luxury. Rebel in Ionia's rich living. Have the husband you want. Now, as Charius is really dying, I beg one last favor of you, Calerho. When I die, approach my body, and if you can, shed a tear. That will mean more to me than immortality. Bend over my gravestone and say, even if your husband and child are watching, you are gone now, Charius, gone for good. You are dead now. I was going to choose you in the king's court. I shall hear you, my wife. Perhaps I shall even believe you. The gods of the underworld will respect me the more for your action. Even if in Hades people forget the dead, even there, I shall remember you, my dear. So, with such expressions of distress, he kissed the noose. You are my consolation, my advocate, he said. I am the victor, thanks to you. You show more affection for me than Calerho. As he was stepping up, 
and fitting his neck to the noose. His friend Polycharmus burst in. Unable any longer to comfort him, he restrained him forcibly out of his mind as he was. And now the day of the appointed trial was upon them.